sense healing in the room you know healing is something that we can do at any time just like Jesus you just minister healing but somehow I do feel like there's some sort of a healing here and the good news is is that I can talk whatever that is can keep happening so just if God is doing something in your heart just allow that to continue I live to see healing to see the broken made whole to see what was stolen restored to see what was wrong made right and how many of you know that God has all the power he can do anything he wants he doesn't exercise that power on the earth because of free will and because of delegation he's given us the power and told us to exercise it because he's sitting down remember that means that sometimes bad things happen it's not because God chooses to allow it or doesn't prevent it it's because we do we allow it so I would go ahead and say that God isn't in the business necessarily of preventing bad things from happening but he is really passionate about redeeming those things. I think the cross is probably a great example of that. That sucked for Jesus, but God took it and turned the greatest good out of it. And you see that all throughout scripture, and you can see that in your lives. I can see it in my life. So just because something bad happens, don't take that to mean that God allowed it or God did it to teach you something. But no matter how you got into the pickle, no matter what bad happened to you, whether it was your own fault or other people's fault, you can count on redemption. And the great thing about God's redemption is that it always looks better than if the tragedy hadn't happened in the first place. We come out on the other side of adversity looking a whole lot better than we did before we went into it. Does adversity automatically make us stronger? No, it doesn't. Sometimes people will tell you that because it helps us feel better about bad things. But I have seen adversity absolutely wreck people, destroy them. In fact, Jesus talked about adversity. Remember his parable about the sower who sowed the seeds on the different types of ground? He actually said that when he sows the seeds into bad soil, the weeds grow up and, and choke out the life of the plant. He explained what that means. I love it when Jesus tells a parable and then he actually explains it. He said, the weeds are the trials of this world. G people, Christians especially, think God sends us trials to make us stronger. It's not what Jesus said. He said that the weeds, the trials come to choke out your faith. Another word for trial, it can be translated test or even temptation. Same word. James said, let no man ever say that he is tempted by God. For God himself cannot be tempted and he tempts no man or woman. If the same word could be translated as tempt, test, or try, James could equally be saying, let no man say that he is being tested or tried by God. God does not in the business of wounding his children. Here's a question for you. If trials, if adversity could change us and make us better, why did he send Jesus to redeem us? Because testing and trials don't make us better. God wasn't interested in fixing what was broken. He killed what was broken and raised us up into new life. But as long as Christians keep going around thinking that the slate has been wiped clean and now we have a second chance, so you better not squander it, better not abuse it, they are not actually getting and receiving the true gospel, nor are they preaching the true gospel. The cross did not fix you. It killed you. And the resurrection brought you new life. 
If you don't believe me, open up your New Testament. Stick your finger somewhere. Paul is probably going to be talking about the fact that you're dead and that you've been given new life all throughout Scripture. That's the point of the gospel. That is the gospel. Good news, everybody. God hasn't just wiped the slate clean. He rebuilt you, gave you a brand new slate. And it's like unwritable on. I feel as though Christians do not understand what happened at the cross. They do not understand the depths that Jesus went to. They do not understand the heights of life that he gave us. And that results in such an inferior Christianity, if you can even call it that, that Christians seriously have to go around trying to make sin sound as scary and evil as possible, trying to control people through fear. That's how much they don't believe in Jesus. The church will give you a spirit of fear to try and curb your bad behavior. God says, I did not give you a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power, of love, and of a sound mind, which, by the way, a better and newer translations will say of self-control, a spirit of power, a spirit of love, and a spirit of self-control. But I've always heard that God is in control. God is in control. Don't worry, God is in control. God, that really sucks that your little boy died, but God is in control. Oh, that just sucks that you lost your job, but don't worry, God has a plan. He is in control. If God is so in control, why did he give you a spirit of self-control? I don't know. I can think on that one. Also, if God is in control, and the book of 2 Peter says that God is not willing that any man should perish, but that all should have eternal life, let me say that again. God is not willing that any man should perish, but that all should come to eternal life. Do you all believe that? That God doesn't want any man to perish, but all to come into eternal life. But Jesus said that narrow is the gate that leads to life. Few will pass through that one. But broad is the gate that leads to destruction, and many will enter there. So, we've got Jesus saying that not everybody will come to eternal life. In fact, most will not. But then you have over here, God's not willing. His will is that no man should perish. People are perishing, but God's will is not that people should perish. If God is in control, how is that possible? This is some things for you to chew on over the next couple of weeks and then also to get offended and upset about so that you can complain to the staff members. Winston said that God is not in control. That's a crutch I've leaned on my whole life. And clearly it's worked really well for me. Who would have thought that the news that God is not in control could be good news? It is. And I cannot wait to tell you more about it. So tune in next week. I'm talking about tonight about redemption. God's plan has always been for redemption. Always. 99% of churches, if you walk in and listen to the sermons, you don't get that idea that God's plan is always for redemption. You more get the idea that the wrath of God was poured out on us because we were in sin. And he is a just God. Is he not a just God? He is a God of justice. And to deny his justice would be to deny his nature. Therefore, sin had to be punished. And just before God pulled the plug on this whole thing, he thought, no. Oh, I guess I'll give these guys a second chance. Jesus, do your thing. All right, you guys, I sent my son to die for you. I'm giving you a second chance, so don't mess this up. Don't you dare use my grace as a license to sin. That's the message that you hear. If you grew up in church, more than likely, that's what you were left with. We just narrowly escaped his wrath 
being poured out. Thank God that Jesus is nicer than God, right? Thank God that Jesus is nicer. So he came down, and now, like, you know, people will say, it's a courtroom, and you've got God with his gavel going, all right, next case. Ah, Winston, what, what did he do wrong? And devil's like, oh, let me tell you. He did this and this and this and this and this and this and this. He, ooh, he wrapped up quite a debt. You know the punishment for him. The punishment for him is death. The devil is clearly a homosexual. So you got Satan reading off this long list of accusations against us, right? And we're like, oh, God, I deserve death. I deserve death. And then Jesus is over here, and he's like, oh, what? Oh, oh, I'll, I'll, um, your honor, I'll pay his debt. I'll do it. I, I'll cover him. Okay, we're good. And then God's like, okay, my justice has been served because the debt is paid, and, and you got off easy. And you're like, Jesus, you paid my debt. I don't, I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy. Please don't even look at me. And then we go to the rest of our lives feeling obligated to like go to church on Sundays, but never to actually approach him or have a relationship with him, right? Because we're not worthy. And if you F up again after what he did for you, you really don't feel worthy, huh? Seriously, how could you do that to him? After all he did for you, and then you're going to go right back and smoke a joint? That's the picture that's painted, though. Am I right? I know I'm being dramatic. I always am. But it's because it's so damn easy to make fun of. It's easy to make fun of this because it's ridiculous. It's like as ridiculous as some of the more ridiculous superstitions that the world has to offer. It's because that's what was taught to them, and they don't have education. They don't know any better. We believe the same superstitious, re, re, in honor of Leah, retardonculousness as that, only we have it packaged under a steeple in pews and a stained glass. Let me tell you something. God's plan was always for redemption. His wrath was never poured out on you. He was never mad at any of you, never mad at me, never. Is he a God of justice? Yeah. Yeah, he is. Justice is a huge part of his nature. Justice is a huge part of my wife's nature. It means a lot to her. I just want to hear your guys' thoughts. What do you think justice is? What would you guys say you, that you think justice is or that the prevailing idea of justice is? Any thoughts? Fair. Right and fair? Whom, whom else? Getting what you deserve. Anybody else? Okay. Yeah, that's, I think that's the prevailing view, basically. Um, it's making something fair, getting what you deserve. Do you know what the word justice, I believe it's Greek, and it comes from the word balance. Justice means balance. Have you all seen the fairly typical statue in, like, courthouses a balanced scale and usually a blindfold because justice is blind. You all know what I'm talking about? You see, a scale is supposedly representative of the notion of justice because justice has always meant balance. So let me ask you a question. If I go out and murder somebody and then as punishment they murder me, is that justice? No. All it does is skew the balance even more, right? Old Testament notions of justice, and God hated this, by the way. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, yep. What's Jesus' idea of justice? Someone takes your cloak? Exactly. Okay, all right. I'm quitting my day job. It's all you. That's good. That's exactly right. Jesus' definition of justice is balance. And getting what you deserve is not balance. Or getting the same thing that you did is not balance. 
It doesn't work. All you have to do is look at our justice system in this nation, incarceration nation, which locks away more people, three times as many people per capita as the next in line, which I believe is Germany, and that is three times as many as the next in line, which is China. Did you know that by the year 2020, if the rates continue as they are, by the year 2020, in seven years, one out of every three American citizens over the age of 18 will be a felon? America comprises of 1% of the world's population, but we're responsible of 75% of the world's incarcerations. And it's working because no more crimes are being committed here. <laughs> wow. Jump by 100,000? Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't work. Just a great case in point. Thank you, United States. We're actually a country that's very vindictive, very hung up on justice, the wrong kind of justice. That's why we revel in shows like, um, well, like Judge Judy and People's Court and Nancy Grace you know, we love to see people get in trouble. We love to see people get locked away. We love it. As a culture, we eat it up. Yeah. Yeah. But that's not Jesus' way. So it's hard to believe then that God, who has the nature of true justice, could demand punishment for sin. If some people got a hold of this, I mean that in two ways. If some people got a hold of this truth, it would change their lives. And also, if some people got a hold of this tape, they would murder me. God's justice is redemption. God's justice. I love this. God's justice is Jesus is hanging on the cross. The Son of God, God himself, hanging on a cross. He looks down at his accusers, and he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And in response to that, one of the soldiers hears him and says, surely this man was God. God's plan has always been for redemption. His wrath was not poured out on sinners. His wrath was poured out on sin. Sin is spiritual death. That's what it is. That's what it was from the beginning. When Adam and Eve ate the fruit of the forbidden tree, the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the Bible's clear. They died it says, when Adam and Eve ate the fruit, they died. They didn't need punished. They needed life. Let me ask you this. If God's wrath and his justice is so strong, if he is so angry, his wrath has poured out on sin, how come the very next thing that happened when Adam ate of the fruit is God's walking through the garden whistling? <laughs> I can't really. God is walking through the garden. Adam, where are you, buddy? Let's hang out. It's time for us to walk and talk. I'm, I'm sure that God didn't know that Adam had eaten the fruit, right? Yeah. He, he knew. He came down anyway to walk and talk with his best friend. Adam was the one who hid. And God allowed that to happen. In fact, he himself killed an animal the very first death on earth. Killed an animal, made coverings for Adam and Eve so that they didn't feel naked. It wasn't that their private parts were showing, okay? Let's get one thing clear. Adam wasn't like, gotta hide my junk. Eve wasn't like, oh no, my boobs. That's not what happened here. Just think about it. That doesn't make any sense. It was a spiritual covering. The Bible says that they were crowned in glory. What happened was the glory left them. Why? Because glory is life. 
they died, therefore glory was not on them. They felt naked because the glory that they were accustomed to left. But God did not leave. He still wanted to hang out with them. Have you all ever heard something along the lines of, sin cannot exist in the presence of a holy God? You guys heard that? B.S. If sin cannot exist in the presence of a holy God, and Adam was like first sinner, and God was holy back then, why did he come down and walk and talk, want to walk and talk with Adam? <laughs> Abraham? Has anybody read up on this guy? He was like a sinner among sinners. He was like impregnating people left and right and whoring out his wife and everything. Did that stop God from visiting with him? Nope. How about Moses, a murderer, a liar, smelled like old people? How many times did God, like, show up with Moses? If Moses was a sinner, how is it that he could be in the presence of a holy God? Oh, here's another one. Enoch. Enoch. Right? This guy, according to Genesis, was like, boom, translated to heaven. You guys remember this? Boom. And he was in the presence of God. Was... <laughs> That is true, and she can barely handle that. <laughs> she is red. This is where she got her name, right here. <laughs> How many of you believe that Enoch never sinned? Right. Clearly he did. Everybody except for Jesus, right? So Enoch had sin, let alone like just being born into the human race. He touched himself impurely and he was lusting after chicks and he was smoking on the pipe and he was listening to rock and roll. But God translates him, boom, and he was instantly in, in God's presence but sin can't exist in the presence of a holy God, right? Exactly. Then you have people saying, well, but Jesus, Jesus removes sin and it was retroactive. So, so like, so Enoch was like, he believed in Christ. So he looked into the future and Believed in Christ and, and yeah, and so then he, and so he was saved. That's how it happened. That had to be how it happened. Isn't that crazy? We'll twist anything we can to make it fit our narrow mindedness. Yeah, people preach this. Same thing with David. David had a lot of, you know, Jewish uh, chutzpah. It's a lot of nerve, basically, the Jews would say chutzpah. David was Jewish, a red-headed Jew. He was all like coming into God's presence with a sacrifice of praise and all that sort of thing. I kind of remember something about David having this affair and then murdering the chick's husband and everything. I would count that as sin, and yet he dwelt in the presence of a holy God. We've got to get this notion out of our minds that somehow sin separates us from God. It doesn't, and it never has. What? What? Even before the cross, Pastor Davenport, even before the cross? Yes, even before the cross, sin did not separate us from a holy God. We separated us from a holy God with our stinking thinking. And guess what? The cross had nothing to do with it. That same stinking thinking is still happening today in the church. What is wrong with us? 
I'm not worthy. Jesus paid my debt. I'm not worthy. We gotta address and obliterate that mindset. The only thing that separated us from God was death. And now we've been raised to new life. The gospel, the good news that God is telling us to tell everybody out there. Good news. Sin is not an issue. It does not separate you from me. It never has. Because of Christ, not only is sin removed, but the true separation, spiritual death, doesn't have to keep us apart any longer. All you have to do is acknowledge that you are right with me. All you have to do is know and believe that because of what I have done, there's nothing between us anymore. This thing you think is separating us, it's not real. Be reconciled to me. Repent. Repent means change your mind. Change your way of thinking. God's not saying, come to me and list off all your sins so that I may forgive you. He's saying, you are already forgiven. Now be reconciled to me. Change your mind. Repent. Because right now, you feel like something is separating you from me. Change your mind. Repent. There is nothing separating you from me. There is nothing in this world, said Paul, that can separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. When Jesus died on the cross, this is crucial, of vital importance. He was not a spectator that said in a courtroom, I'll pay their debt. If this drama were unfolding in a courtroom, let me explain to you how it would look. You have God saying, what are the charges here? And you have the devil, the accuser of the brethren, the adversary, and he says, oh, wait till you hear what Davenport did. Get a load of this, God. And he lists off all these things. And God pulls up his laptop, opens up Winston Davenport's tab, bing, and it's empty. Nothing there. And God says, mm, you're lying. You're lying, Satan. I'm looking at his record right now. There's nothing here. There are no charges against Winston Davenport. And Satan says, no, I saw him do that. In fact, I tempted him. I was the one who set this stuff up. I watched him do it. And God says, are you challenging my record-keeping system here? I'll tell you what. Give me those sins again. Let me type them in and do a search. Bing! Ah, here they are. I see them now. Let's see whose name is, whose account is, uh, Jesus. This is Jesus' account. My records show that he committed those transgressions. Is that taking it too far? Jesus became sin itself. He was tempted in every way that we are tempted, and yet he did not sin. Have you thought about the implications of that? Why don't you think about one of your deepest, darkest, secret temptations? Don't say it out loud, please. <laughs> we all know that it's going to be nastier than anybody could ever have guessed. Every single one of us. Jesus had that same temptation. Oh, God. Is that blasphemy? No, it's biblicsy. I'm not the one who said it. They might stone me for saying it on tape. I'm not the one who said it. I'm repeating what the Bible says. In every way, Jesus was tempted like us, 
If Jesus became exactly like us, had a fully human body, fully human emotions, he grew up, he was probably teased, bullied, whatever. He saw hot chicks. He was tempted in every way, just like you and me. But he didn't sin. And then at the cross, he took the sins of the world upon himself. And his tab in that courtroom became very long, very fast. All sin for all time, even ones that haven't been committed yet, even for people that don't accept him. 1 John 2.2 2 says, Jesus did not only take away our sin, but the sins of the world. If the devil stood before God in that courtroom with Adolf Hitler standing there, this man is guilty of genocide of your people, God, of the Jews, the chosen ones. God would say, genocide, type it in. Oh, I found it. That, I see, is on the tab of Jesus. Adolf Hitler's tab, completely blank, sinless. You can name them off. Serial killers, serial rapists, whoever you want, yourself. That was the depth of the exchange that occurred at the cross. It is not enough to say that Jesus paid your debt as though he had some extra cash laying around and you owed some debt, so he was like, I'll get that. He did not pay for your sins. He took your sins upon himself. He did not just take the punishment for your sins upon himself. He took the sins themselves upon himself so that you could be free And we are wallowing around. I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy. I had a lustful thought today. I had anger. I cussed. That's disgusting. What a mockery of such a brutal and beautiful act of redemption. But when you grasp, when you are willing to receive it, and I know even in this room there are resistances right now. It's like he's taking it too far. That's not what I've been told. It rubs me the wrong way. That's fine. You can take it or leave it. But apparently what you were taught wasn't working or you wouldn't be here. If you're believing what everybody else believes, chances are you're heading through the broad gate that leads to destruction. But if you want to go through that narrow gate that leads to life, you should realize there will be times when you are standing alone. When we stop compromising the grace message, that is a great place to start. When we stop watering it down with law, with fear, basically prostituting out the whole cross, God's plan of redemption, that gate leads to destruction. Many will enter it, and I have seen them my whole life, and I was one of them, walking toward that broad gate of destruction. Oh, don't think it's the homeless people that are smoking drugs and doing alcohol. (laughs) Those are not the people that Jesus was talking about. It was the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, the religious people. They thought they had it figured out. They did not even know that Jesus was the Son of God. Through the broad gate they went. Let's be different. Let's take this gospel message too far. If we're going to go to one ditch or the other, if we're going to err on the side of danger... Let's accuse God of having actually done too much. 
Let's accuse God of being too radical with his redemption. That's my suggestion. It's late. I have a couple things to tell you, just a couple testimonies, both talking about God's plan of redemption. She was talking about Becca earlier. We saw Becca and Christy in Seattle. Becca needed a lot of money to do her internship at City Church. And when she left here and went to Billings, she was just at a church and um, talking to some people about where she came from and where she was going. And a lady just came up and gave her $1,000. Boom. Then she got another 1000 I don't think it was from one person, but a few other people gave her money and got another 1000 That's an expensive internship. There's a woman who has changed so radically in the year that she was here, and she's driven forward. And she has such vision for her life, and you can just see the pieces falling into place. Her joy was so infectious. It was great. She's like, you don't want to say goodbye to her because she's such a light. A light. She's like a light. I didn't always feel that way about Becca, just so you know. And Christine, like she said, Christine is going through some challenges. um, And I was a little discouraged talking to her. But I have to tell you this testimony that happened today that even you do not know about because you do not answer my phone. (laughs) Who did this? Justice must be served. So we're talking to Christine, and she had been going to City Church, but she just felt like she wasn't able to develop relationships there. It's a large church several thousand members. She wasn't able to develop relationships there, and she kind of felt like, like, uh, I, like isolated or like on the fringe, which is fine. Mega churches are not for everybody. So she got discouraged, but she, she went online and was looking for churches in the area, and she goes to something called the Elijah List. I don't know if you guys have heard of it. It's basically a list online um, that that classifies spirit-led churches with, like, powerful worship or anointed, you know, ministers or whatever. Bill Johnson, Jason Upton, Dennis Rainier, he's on the Elijah list, for instance. So she got onto this Elijah list and found a church nearby on Capitol Hill called the Church of the Indignified. And she thought, boy, that sounds like me. So she went to this church, and she's like, you know, you know, she says she really likes the church. It's very small. This is an important fact. It's only like she said, 25 or 30 people. Small church. Recently planted. Church of the Undignified. But she goes, and she immediately connects. The pastor and his wife kind of like take her in, and they're praying for her and giving her these words of knowledge and everything. She feels like this is a place where she can receive and give the type of relationship that she wants. So I'm like, that's awesome. Good for you. I think that's better. Personally, I think that's better than a mega church, unless you somehow get really connected into a small group or something. But, but this is where she went. But Christine, because she is the least decisive person I've ever met, is like, but I just don't know if it's God. I don't really know if this is where I'm supposed to be. I don't want to make any, you know, I don't, I don't want to just go what seems right or whatever. I'm tired of making mistakes in life. I want to be where God wants me to be. And I don't think that's city church, but I'm not convinced that that's this other church of the indignified. And I'm like, well, you know what? Go where you have peace. Don't wait for a booming voice from heaven to tell you. Just go. And if it, if it feels right to you, that's probably where you should be. And if you change your mind later, that's fine. You can go to a different church. It's not like it's the end of the world. So she's like, okay, I'm just not sure. Okay, see you later. Okay, so here's the testimony. So today, you all know my best friend, Peter Hartzell, led worship. No, you guys weren't even here back then. Um, He's a worship leader at Midtown. He's my best friend in the whole world, ever, except my wife. Number one best friend. He's my best male friend. So, So I went over... I went, over to his, yeah, I went over to his house today, and he wasn't there, and his wife wasn't there, but I went over there to do some work for them that they needed done. There's a mysterious car parked in the driveway. So I walk in, and there's this couple there. Um, 
They're like, hi, hello? And I'm like, hi, who are you? Oh, oh, we're friends of Peter's, and we're just visiting for a couple days, and I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm his best friend. <laughs> just, just to get one thing clear. And I'm here to do some work. Where are you guys from? So we start chatting, and I tell them, and we know, I'm very friendly, so we start talking, and I learn their names. Uh, John and Jackie. Uh, I'm like, where are you guys from? They're like, oh, we're actually visiting from Seattle. And I'm like, oh, cool. My wife and I were just there a few days ago in Seattle. Oh, no way, man. Right on. What were you doing there? Oh, let me tell you. We were going to the pier and we ate at Ivers. And we also visited a couple of friends of ours who had recently completed at Teen Challenge. I said, my wife is the program coordinator at Teen Challenge in, here in Missoula. And a couple of students have recently completed and moved to Seattle. So we went to, while we were there to see them and, and have dinner with them. And, and she's like, oh, Teen Challenge, I've heard of that. I heard that's a really good program. Assembly of God, right? I'm like, yep, that's it. And um, I'm like, so what do you guys do in Seattle? Like, um, she like looks at him like a little bit embarrassed or something. She's like, we actually um, planted a church recently in Seattle. I'm like, right on, your pastors. And they're like, yeah, it's called the Church of the Undignified. I'm like, the Church of the Indignified? Are you kidding me? <laughs> They're like, yeah, it's real small. It's like maybe 25 or 30 people. Um, but we just really believe that God has called us to Capitol Hill. We have a heart for discipleship. We feel that the church has really messed up in that they just, they just uh, disqualify people left and right who don't look like they think, like we think that they should look. And he's like, we see so much value in those people. And I'm like, you have no idea. That is my heart too. I'm like, you have no idea. I'm so excited about this. Anyway, I'm like, so the girl, one of the girls that left, Christine, I'm like, she said she goes there and she's like, the, the girl goes, Christine, like, real little cute thing? And I'm like, yeah. And she's like, I have chills all over my body right now. Are you serious? Yeah. And she's like, oh, my gosh. That girl came to our church a couple of weeks ago, and we instantly heard from God that, that she was like a divine appointment, that she was going to be friends with us, that we were to pour into her life, that God had a huge plan for her. In Missoula, you run into people all the time. It's a town of 65,000 people. I just ran into um, Amanda and Michelle today at Hastings. Right? Good. Nah. Well, any, in all fairness, if anybody went to Hastings, they would probably find me there. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, you run into people left and right at Hastings or wherever in Missoula. Seattle is a city of 2 million people. The Church of the Indignified has 2530, from what I hear, on a good Sunday, <laughs> Sunday night. And our little Christine got connected with them. Two days later, they're in Missoula at my best friend's house. <laughs> I called her. I just called her and I'm, I just told her the story. I'm like, this is kind of weird. So, okay, here we go. I'm at Peter's house, all right? Okay, and I walk in and there's these people. And she, and she and you know, you can hear on the other end of the phone. In fact, I'm pretty sure her tears went through the phone and got my face wet. <laughs> just sobbing. Couldn't even talk. She's like, you have no idea. I've been needing this. I've been needing this. I've been needing this. And I'm like, what exactly were you saying? What do you need? What did you need? What is this to you that you need? She's like, I just needed to know that God was still involved. I just needed to know that he still had his hand in this. She feels like she's painted herself into a little bit of a corner in life. And that could be, but God is a God of redemption. He is so calculating the master chess player he took that little girl out of city church. He put her in that little church. Then he sent the pastors to this little town, to that little house in East Missoula. And then he sent this big guy 
to do some housework. God did that for Christine. Oh, an alcoholic, someone who's messed up in life, somebody who everybody else has given up on. God did that for her. That is his plan for redemption. And he would do the same for every single one of you. And he would do the same for people out there who don't even believe in him. You're going to tell me that sin separates you from a holy God? If anything, sin attracts him to you. The Bible says where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. Where sin abounds, grace abounds. I just sang this song, grace is Jesus. Grace came. If Jesus is God, Jesus is grace, God is grace, where sin abounds, God abounds even more. What? It's true. That's the gospel. Go preach it wherever you go. If they throw stones at you, don't throw them back because that's not justice. Hand them back nicely. (laughs) Father, thank you so much for these young women. Thank you so much for your plan. Thank you that you are intimately involved in our lives. Thank you that you are working all things together for our good, that you are a God of redemption. And thank you for the best part, that you do it through us. We are your plan of redemption. We are the messengers. We are the ones who carry the cure. We are your antivirus on this earthly computer. We are your light, and darkness does not stand a chance. I just bless these girls. I bless you. I send you all as well. Everything is made right in your lives. Loose ends are tied up. Fears are vanquished. Life abounds. There is nobody and no thing that can stop you. You are the chosen. You are the called. You are the elect. God will not carry out his plan without you. Because the way he has set it up, he cannot do it without you because you are his plan A and he has no plan B. That's how confident he is in you. So sleep in heavenly peace tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you guys for letting me come and hang out with you.